Hello there, lovelies, and welcome to Take Me to Eternity with Leah Fiore. I am the host of this podcast, if you did not know that. In this podcast, I examine what the Word says about the things coming into the church through the Word of God, and I try to help you apply it to your life, or at least try and see things from a different perspective, maybe one you haven't thought of before. I've been learning a lot about our roles as Christians in this world, how to live in those roles in a godly way, and what that means compared to what the world says. So today I'm going to talk about our roles in marriage. First, I have to say, some people aren't cut out for marriage, and that's okay. Not everyone needs to be married. The Bible talks about people being single, and believe it or not, it talks about it as a really good thing, in a very beautiful light. I know that it isn't for everyone, and I know that's not what the world tells us, but not everyone's meant for marriage. Not everyone wants to get married, and there shouldn't be an issue with that. If you can live without lust and sexual desire, it's a beautiful thing to stay single. Marriage is the hardest thing I ever did before I had kids, and I yes, I had to put the before I had kids part in there. But thankfully, at least for me, it's an amazing and wonderful thing, so long as you establish that God is the head in your relationship, and you know that it's a choice that you have to make to love your partner. Sometimes we're not so lovable, and that goes for everybody. I want to define what marriage is in a general um, kind of definition that society would accept, right? So this is the Merriam-Webster definition. The state of being united as spouses in a consensual and contractual relationship recognized by law. The mutual relation of married persons, wedlock. The institution whereby individuals are joined in marriage, an intimate or close union. The more biblical definition, I would say, is one that's a bit different. The 1828 definition says, marriage, the act of uniting a man and woman for life. You see the difference already. Wedlock, the legal union of a man and woman for life. Marriage is a contract, both civil and religious by which the parties engage to live together in mutual affection and fidelity till death shall part them. Marriage was instituted by God himself for the purpose of preventing the promiscuous intercourse of the sexes, for promoting domestic felicity, and for securing the maintenance and education of children. It's a bit of a different um, definition there, isn't it? We are told in Genesis 1, and 28, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Our view of partnership comes from the very beginning, We're told that we are made male and female in the image of God, not to say that we physically look like him, but we have characteristics that he alone has. Mainly, what differs us from all other creatures is our soul. God made us to live with him for eternity, therefore he made our soul to last for eternity. We aren't like God in the sense that he had no beginning, but we are like him in the sense that we won't have an end, and that is believers and unbelievers alike. So when you say you have an eternal soul, that's not to say you didn't have a beginning, because you did. We just aren't going to have an end. There's also the fact that God made us with free moral agency. We have free will and can choose. Men and women are both made in the image of God. We are made to partner with him in this life, though. You know, we're made to need him. Genesis 2.18 says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. We're made to be in a relationship with other humans. We are social creatures and are meant to share our lives with others. Being alone is not good. 
Now that it isn't to say that you have to get married, it just means that we need other humans, other human contact. The world is fighting to have less and less human interaction and calling it good, but God said it isn't good for a man to be alone. I think that women and men were made to be together. We were made for each other. And while I find absolute value in celibacy, if God has given you the grace to live in that manner, I think there's a unique beauty in both celibacy and marriage, and even if you're celibate, you still need humans around you. With celibacy, you could more easily focus on God as a whole. You can devote yourself entirely to Him and what He wants of you and for you. In this, there's a beautiful role you have in this life, a total devotion to God. With marriage, however, the man and woman become one, and I think that's super important to grasp. If more people looked at their marriage partner like they were just as important as them, they would be so much better at thinking about their wants and needs more. Better at not taking offense at things and instead finding grace for getting to the bottom of an issue that caused the offense in the first place. We would spend more time loving the other in a more selfless way and not looking at what we want in every situation or putting our wants and needs in front of theirs. Truthfully, I think marriage helps to sanctify us, getting us ready for a heavenly eternity. But so does having kids for that matter. (laughs) So does every relationship does that, I think. Genesis 2, 20-24 says, The man gave names to all the cattle, and to the birds of the sky, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man, and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother, and be joined to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This is such a wonderful depiction. This is why women should submit to their husbands, because he was made to take the lead. In that we are to walk alongside him. He is to love his wife as Christ loved the church, and she is to respect him. There's a beauty in that as seen in the making of them. She was made from him because that is how they are to treat each other. She comes from him and respects his role as the head, and he loves her as his own body. I have heard countless times how derogatory the Bible is because it says that a woman is to be a man's helper. They make it to be this nasty less than thing, when in reality men and women are both made in the image of God. God doesn't view one better than the other. We do, however, have different roles. The point, though, is that we are to be partners. There are various places in the Bible where the word helper is used. In Psalms it says, God is our helper, and Jesus said he was going to send a helper, one that is like him which is the Holy Spirit. So to say that helper means anything other than someone who helps is just not right. It's not less than. If he's calling woman less than by saying helper, then he is saying I am less than also, which we know that's not the case, right? God makes it clear that there is a role that we play and how our roles are to function. So many argue about marriage and what it means But if we go by a biblical definition written throughout the Bible over and over again, God's parameters are a holy and sacred union between one man and one woman. At no point does God say that that anything else is okay. We are made to come together to be as one and to procreate. He told them to be fruitful and multiply. He wants us to fill the world with little babies that will glorify him. When we look at the creation story, we can see the defined lines of what he set. He tells us right there what our role is and how we ought to function within the context of what marriage looks like. But there is more as we go through the Bible on how to properly love each other and treat each other in the covenant of marriage. 
marriage is a covenant. We have different roles as partners. We can't both assume the role of head. We can't all be in charge at the same time, and at the same time, we can't both leave it to the other to make the decisions. There needs to be order, and order is what God has so lovingly given us. One of the things we are seeing these days is women trying to take the man's role in marriage. We have two parties fighting for power, and someone has to, in the end, submit, or so many times it leads to a standstill, and in turn divorce, because nobody can be Nothing can be accomplished when everyone tries to take the lead. Women try so hard to take a man's role, and we suck at being men, so it doesn't go very well. When God explicitly tells us the chain of command, he does so for a reason. Men are to be women's protectors. They are to lead and protect and to guide. That doesn't mean that a woman can't have an opinion or make any decisions, but it does mean that there's a point where we absolutely are to submit to what our husbands say. I think too often people misunderstand what submission is. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11.3, But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. If a man is truly subject to Christ, then he's going to be a man who knows his role. He has very important instructions on how to treat his wife, and if a man is following what Christ said, then there's no man that I would be rather subject to than my husband who's in submission to Christ. We'll talk about this role, though, as we go. In the Bible, marriage is a beautiful symbol of Christ in the church. It illustrates a divine relationship. As we look at the verses that pertain to marriage, there's a reoccurring theme. Christ is the lead, the center, the head. He is the one that the man is subject to. He is the one that the church is subject to. The Bible talks about the church being the bride of Christ and that there will be a great wedding feast when we are in heaven, that we are to present ourselves blameless and pure for our bridegroom. The whole book of Hosea shows a view of God's unfailing love and devotion to his bride. It shows how we play the harlot and how faithful God is. A marriage is supposed to be the unity of a man and a woman in a holy bond, and they ought to take it seriously. The man ought to treat his woman with love, and when he treats her as Christ treats the church, that speaks volumes for how that's to happen. When we look at the life of Jesus, we look at how he treated his followers, the saints, the church, We see him taking care of, being kind to, showing grace and mercy to the people around him. He provided for and went without for the people around him. He was patient with them. He died for them. When he was tired and weary, he still kept doing for them. How did Christ love the church? He loved us so much that he gave his life for us. He loved us so much that while we were his enemies, He died for us. He was hated and took on the wrath of God so that we might have a chance to be right with God. He was ridiculed, beaten, and killed for the church. That's some hardcore love right there. If a man is to love his wife like Christ loves the church, that means he's to protect to no end, to cleanse and teach and be gentle and understanding to. I think that's pretty awesome. I mean, why would you not want to submit to a man who treats you that well, right? That means that he's going to make good choices for himself and for you. He's going to think about you and care about you, right? Jesus said we are the sheep and he is the shepherd. He says he will leave the 99 to find the one lost sheep. That means he pursues us and he lovingly brings us back to him. I love the the phrase that is um, you're you've never you're never too far gone right? You, you've never taken so many steps away from Christ that you can't come back to him. Or um, the one that says, no matter how many steps away from Christ you take, all you have to do is take one to get back to him. You just turn around and he's right there, right? So I'm going to read a long passage and then I want to break it down. 
I want you to hear it in context, and then we can talk about the implications of it. Ephesians 5, 22-33 Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. Having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also cherished the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great. But I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. At the beginning of that, it says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands. And I, I think that some women misunderstand that, and some churches teach wrongly on that. I think we are to be subject to our husbands and we aren't to be subject to other men. That's just, I strongly believe that one. So everyone gets stuck on the first part. Wives be subject to your own husbands. But I think this is a key part to a happy marriage. This doesn't mean you are lower than or less than. We can't have two people running the show. Otherwise, there would be times of complete standstill. This is a willing submission. If man is to be subject to God and woman subject to man, then a holy subject husband is going to be the example of masculine love. He will care for his wife and be the spiritual leader. We are sanctified by the word and men are supposed to be the spiritual leaders. That means he helps his wife stay pure or helps purify her with the word. Through learning God's word, we are cleansed of wrong thinking and convicted of wrongdoing. A man is to help his wife by helping her be closer to the Lord. It also helps to guide us in our discernment and um, our conscience, right? Recalibrating everything by the word of God so that we are calibrated accurately and um, viewing the world properly through a biblical worldview, through God's worldview, right? If husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies, that means caring for us and providing for us so that we're taken care of. That means caring about our hearts and caring about if we're getting what we need. And women are to respect their husbands. I think part of the problem with relationships is that they mess with the order of things. They marry for looks or money or who they want that person to be and not marry the person for who they are. You shouldn't marry someone with an idea of who you want them to turn into. If they are a jerk to begin with, you're probably going to have a jerk later on, right? You shouldn't keep dating them. Find someone who puts God first and you will automatically be second. Women need to make sure that they understand their role is absolutely ne necessary also. When God created the world, he created things and said they were good. He created one thing after another and said it is good. It is good. It is good. It is good. And then after he created man, he said it is not good for man to be alone. That's the first time he said it wasn't good. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Wives are helpmates. We walk beside our husbands and we help them through life. They help us, but that's our job is to, to help them. It doesn't sound less than to me, especially when we are helpers to someone who is subjected to God, right? Colossians three eighteen through 21 says, Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. 
Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. I love that it says, as is fitting to the Lord. I believe, like anything else, God should always come first, and that we aren't to do anything that would go against the Lord, even to, for our husbands. But if it's not an objection to God, we're absolutely to be submissive. Again, that doesn't mean that we are to be walked all over, or that you could be treated badly. It doesn't mean you have no opinion or no say in anything. It just means that we need to be submitted to our husbands, right? It's pretty clear that a man is to treat his wife well and not to look down on her or be mean. He is supposed to care and love and help purify his wife. It uses the word embittered in this passage. Another word for embittered is harsh. Don't be harsh to your wives. Harsh means rough to the touch, rugged, grating, as harsh sand, harsh cloth, opposed to smooth, rough to the ear, grating, discordant, jarring, as a harsh sound, harsh notes, a harsh voice, rough, rude, abusive, as harsh words, severe. So as you see here, he is to be tender to his wife, gentle with her, care for her. The wife is to be respectful and helpful to her husband, and in the same, care for him. We are supposed to be in a relationship of respect and love, where we go through life looking out for one another. 1 Corinthians 7, 1-6 through 6 says, Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, but because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does, and likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But this I, may, I say by way of concession, not of a command. It says it is good to have a wife or a husband because sex is to be only in a marriage covenant. I have heard so many people get upset because it says women's bodies are not their own and that she ought to fulfill her wifely duty but it also says the same for a man. I think they miss the whole point of this passage. We aren't to use sex as a negotiation. We aren't to deprive the other person simply because. Sexual desires are natural, and we ought to want to fulfill our spouse's wants and needs. I believe that there's times when people need to be understanding and care enough about their spouse to know there are situations that are beyond them and sex isn't always an option. But the point is that we don't just hold back and deprive your spouse. I love that he, that he adds that it is a concession and not a command. It's him telling people sexual impulses are important and should be paid attention to on both sides and that we don't want to do anything outside of marriage. We don't want to do anything that goes against what God says. So you should get married if that is a desire that you have and you should um, not hold yourself back from your spouse. Marriage is about being selfless, not selfish. I mean, isn't our role as humans who follow and want to be like Jesus selfless, selflessness? Our happiness and joy comes from the Lord. He is the one that fulfills us and the one we are to look to for satisfaction. Our marriage can't be our absolute satisfaction. Our children can't fill that role. As we look at the structure for a marriage, it's always to be Christ in the head. He's the ultimate authority. Marriage is not the key to human happiness. God is the key to human happiness. God's always above all and should stay that way. God should always come first and be the most important one to please. His love is the standard for us. 
That's what we strive for, is to love others in the way that reflects the love of Christ. That's a pretty intense love, and it doesn't always look soft and gentle. Sometimes it's strong and protective. Sometimes it's corrective, but always truth and love undergird whatever we are to do. Sometimes we have to do hard things and be willing to take ridicule for it in order to live the life that God has called us to live. Feelings can't dictate how we act or react. I have to say marriage is under attack by Satan. He attacks everything that is pure and good. That's the reason we have counterfeit everything. In order to undermine God and make our lives harder, he messes with the order of things and blurs the line of what is good and lovely and true and right. God has an order because as our maker, he knows the best way for us to function. He knows what's good and right for us, what will harm us, and how we are to live for our best and for the best of others. Society tells us love is love and you are free to love whom you want. That's true in a sense because God told us to love everyone. What's not true is the notion that you can be satisfied and living rightly in a marriage that goes outside of God's structure. You can't rightly be married to somebody that does not fit in the structure that God laid out before us. Marriage is between a man and a woman. Anybody else doing otherwise is perverting God's laid out laws, right? His laid out rules. Marriage in the Bible is always talked about between one man and one woman, unless man perverts it. For instance, polygamy is not ever condoned by God. There is polygamy in the Bible, but it's always outside of what God wants. And if you watch, there's always something that comes out of polygamy that isn't good. Marriage is always supposed to be between believers also. 2 Corinthians 6, 14-16 says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have re righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. In marriage, it says, we become one with the other. We aren't to be bound with an unbeliever, and I believe that's for a lot of reasons. One of which is, when you have children, we are to train them up to love the Lord. And when you have one parent who is a believer and one who is not, you don't have a solid foundation for your children. I think it makes it harder on marriage in general, since what you hold in high regard is different. You simply won't make the same decisions being a believer or an unbeliever. One will corrupt the other, and unfortunately it's generally the unbeliever corrupting the believer. Not always, but more times than not, that's what we see. Though it does say that if you are a believer married to an unbeliever, you are to stay married. For one, I believe because God hates divorce. Another reason is because evil corrupts purity. There are different places that show how a woman who follows after other gods soon entices the man to follow after other gods also. Malachi 2, 13 through 16 says, This is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant, but not one has done so who has a remnant of the Spirit. And what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? Take heed then to your spirit, and let no one dear treacherously against the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel, and him who covers his garment with wrongs, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit, that you do not deal treacherously. So in their customs, the man would cover the woman with his garment as a sign of protection. 
when it says that he covers his garment with wrong, that's an unjust divorce. I think people are too flippant with divorce. I have seen where people divorce for one reason or another, and in getting remarried, live with another person who doesn't fulfill them or has the same tendencies of abuse. I think there are times where, yes, divorce is an option, but rarely is it the solution. I can't tell anyone what's right or wrong for them, just to weigh the cost. It's like saying, how do I want to suffer? Choose rightly. In Matthew, the Pharisees came and were testing Jesus, asking if it was lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all. Matthew 19, 4-9 says, And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, wife except for immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. So I have to say, when we look at these things and we look at what it says about divorce, um, this isn't a condemnation to people who have been through a divorce. That's your past. And, you know, if you feel like you need to repent for it, um, then you need to repent for it. And if you already have, then God's already forgiven you. So we're just looking at what the Bible says about it, right? And we can look at it and say that God hates divorce. And these are the things that he says um, are right and true and good, you know? So now we can just move on from here as to um, what we do with our lives, right? So as soon as we repent and he forgives us, we don't need to stay living in the past and worried about the things that we have done in our past because because that is in the past and we can't do anything about it. But I just don't want anybody to think that in talking about this that I am saying this is um I'm this isn't a condemnation on you. Um we're just talking about what the word says, right? Marriage is intended to be for life. It is to be a loving covenant built with God as the head and honor at the heart. We are supposed to see it as a sacred union, where we are one and are to treat each other with love and respect and kindness. God didn't say it's okay to get a divorce if it gets hard. Life gets hard. People don't always agree and people can be mean and selfish. We're human. Humans are messy. Humans are selfish. That's just how we are with a with a um, sinful nature, right? Some people, however, aren't meant to be married. Matthew 9, 12 says, For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. You can live a wonderfully godly life that honors him and not get married if you cannot be led astray by sexual desires. I believe marriage is there to strengthen us, help us to live a pure and God-honoring life. Ephesians 5 through 6 speaks volumes. 5 starts off telling us to imitate God as beloved children, to walk in love and to be a sacrifice in ourselves to him. It goes on to tell us to be pure in all ways, not to be deceived by empty words, which in my book is easier to do when you have a strong relationship with a godly husband and you are founded in the word. And you guys should go read um, Ephesians 5 through 6. I don't want you to just take my word for it, but it's a lot to just read on here, so I'm going to sum it up. It says not to do the things non-believers do. Don't partake in their ways. We are to walk as children of light, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. It says, don't participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but to expose them. 
It tells us to walk wisely and understand the will of the Lord, to edify one another and praise God, to give thanks always and for all things in the name of Jesus Christ, and to be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. This is the first subject we see in the passage. Be a servant to one another. Then it goes into wives to be subject to your husbands and husbands. Notice it says, be a servant to one another. And then it goes in to wives be subject to your husbands and husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. So many different views of servitude. It says to help her to be pure and love her as his own body. Ephesians 5, 28 through 33 says, so husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you must also love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. This is such a beautiful view of marriage that so often gets neglected, a wonderful overview of how we are to live, a model of a godly marriage. Chapter 6 talks about family relationships children to parents and parents to children, slaves to masters and masters to slaves, and directly after talks about being strong in the Lord and the strength of his might, putting on the full armor of God because there's a spiritual war that is happening and we need to be prepared. It's so beautiful how these things all go together. God protects us all and is the head of us. Man protects his wife and fathers protect children. And while we live this out the way God intended, it strengthens us so that we can be ready for the fight. We're to protect other people. You know, if we're all looking at protecting each other and we're doing it in the right roles, then we all know what our roles are and we can better live out this life. Marriage should strengthen us. Family should strengthen us. Friendships and fellowship are all meant to strengthen us. We put on the armor of God by living a life subject to him and his will and his ways. We put on his armor by bearing with one another and being servants to each other, putting others above ourselves. Such a beautiful picture. I pray that I can live it out as God intended me to, to the best of my ability, be wholly his, devoted to him and pleasing and knowing him, and by doing that, I will in turn be a better wife and mother and friend and just plain human. It's not about us. It's about other people. It's about us loving God and glorifying him. If we all lived in the roles as God intended for us, how amazing would life be? Hebrews 13, 1 through 6 says, Let love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember the prisoners, as though in prison with them, and those who are ill-treated, since you yourselves also are in the body. Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I forsake you, so that we confidently say, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? When God is the head and we fall into line of his roles set out for us, we don't have to deal with the turmoil and the consequences of living a life on our own terms. I think he also wants to show us we can trust him with all of the things and he wants to bless us through the life that he has given us. So the book of Hosea has always been a hard one for me. I never quite understood the beauty of it until I started to see the relationship between marriage and Christ and the church. I, wanted, I watched a um, John MacArthur video and he laid it out really well for me. 
The beauty of Hosea and how amazing God is showing his love for us is such a hard relationship. He said marriage is a living illustration to demonstrate God's relationship to his church. It's a living illustration of how a person is joined together in an unbreakable union with the living God. In it, he talked about Hosea and how God told him to marry Gomer, who was a prostitute. He was to stay faithful to her no matter what she did. It was a way that God showed how he would be to Israel, his bride. Gomer was not innocent. She was a harlot and did so continuously. One thing he said is it sets for us the standard of relationship in a marriage, as it is the image of his relationship to his people. If you read Hosea, it's pretty amazing when you look at it from that perspective. It baffles me how amazing God is, his faithfulness, his kindness, and his patience with us. Through the whole Bible, his patience and loving kindness, just it just gets me. How often do we as his bride play the harlot, raising ourselves up to be God in place of our amazing king, rejecting what we know is right because we just want to do what we want, the ultimate view of forgiveness and redemption. That is what marriage ought to look like. By both being faithful and kind and patient and forgiving. It's not always about feeling. Love is a choice. It's not a feeling. God pursues us when we are doing what we ought not to do. Why then do we think when we aren't happy with our spouse we could even entertain divorce? I understand that there are circumstances that are a cause for divorce. And I'm not speaking to that. But these days people say we just fell out of love or they don't make me happy anymore, or we just don't have anything in common anymore. Love takes effort. And that goes, all love takes effort. Any kind of relationship takes effort. If you don't feel it, you need to stoke the flame. If you feel like you aren't happy, talk to God because he is your source of joy, not your spouse. If you don't have anything in common, then figure out what you have in common. There is going to be something. You have to work at staying growing together and not growing apart. Care about the other person enough to be interested in things you don't necessarily find interesting. Listen listen when they talk about the things that bore you and maybe they will do the same thing. Maybe in it you'll find a middle ground. You can find love despite being so different. You have to take time and effort to stay growing together in the same direction. Don't neglect your spouse because there are other things you find more important. You should care because they care. If my husband's interested in something that I'm not, I find interest simply because he's interested. Doesn't mean I jump right in and get engrossed in it, but at least I listen and I try and care about it, you know, and he does the same thing. And you, you should pray. You should pray together. Pray often and pray for them. If there's a problem, give it to the Lord. My friend says, just tell God on them. God's the only one who can change a man's heart. In conclusion, marriage is sacred, and we should treat it as such. I know I could never be as faithful or patient or loving as God, but with his help and his strength, we can do what's best. But we have to put others first. The whole Bible is a book showing us we ought to care for others. One thing after another, saying, serve each other, care for each other, love one another, even your enemies. And I'm not saying that's all it's about, because, oh my goodness, it's about God, right? It's about God and glorifying God. It's all about God. But he wants us to love others, and it's the perfect view of how we do that. He shows us time and time again how to love other people properly, how to take care of them, and how to forgive them. Every relationship holds importance for one reason or another. I tell my husband he can leave if he wants, but he has to take me with him. <laughs> Our view of every relationship should be one of what can we do for the other person? How can we be the light shining in the darkness? How can we be the example of Christ to them? How much more should we do that in our marriage? So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful for this time we get to share, for the place you have me right now. 
for the ability to dig in and really learn about what you have to say about life and how we are to live. I thank you for the people and the different circumstances you put in my life to help me grow and how you use even the bad for my benefit. Please guide us how to grow closer to you, closer to being who you want. Please give us the hunger for you and your word. Help us to want to know you better and never be satisfied with thinking we know you well enough or have read your word enough, Lord. You are the living God, and we could never fully understand you on this side of heaven. Please bless everyone listening. Help them to hear what you want them to hear, Lord, and filter out what's not helpful to them. I love you so much. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.